lo mejor. Por ejemplo, es cuando you come in and when you go out. And in, on the right is a picture of we have simulations of what happens uh, in the case of electromagnetic wormholes. It, wormholes are a, a shortcut in space time. So uh, it's tantalizing because it gives the possibility of traveling to the past. Okay, so the, the, the other part of the talk, which is, uh, is uh, to show that you can solve some inverse problem for nonlinear wave equations. And this is one of them. This is the sound speed when there is dependence on time. Uh, the, uh, the movie went off without me, without clicking. Uh, so here there are four waves interacting when you have a nonlinear equation and those interactions uh, create an artificial point source, a new wave, and this new wave gives the information about the inverse problem. And the structure of space time. So this is uh, the, the topic of this talk. So uh, very roughly speaking, inverse problems, you have two types of measurements, active measurements, where you send sources, in this case, for instance, uh, in oil exploration. This, uh, most of the oil exploration is done in the ocean, and you have a ship here with a tail, and you send explosions of sound, and these reflect, and you measure the, for instance, the travel time that it takes or the wave itself in these hydrophones. And from that information, you try to deduce where there is oil in this subsurface here. But you're sending explosions. And ultrasound is another example of a active measurement. You send this, in this case, the scale is completely different. Is, and the frequencies are different. You send high frequency waves and you measure the echo. And from that, you create an image of the inside. So passive, passive measurements are the other type of measurements uh, that are produced uh, naturally. For instance, an earthquake here, this is in Mongolia. And these waves penetrate deeply through the earth and from the information given, for instance, for the travel times of the waves, you try to find the inner structure. That's the only way we have to, to go through the center of the earth, uh, realizing Julius Byrne dream. And in medical imaging, an example of passive measurements is uh, magnetoencephalography. The brain activity is measured, it produces uh, produce magnetic fields, although it may be very weak. And those are measures. And from that information, you try to get, for instance, uh, an image of the brain, for in particular, there are problems a tumor or something else. You know, some people produce more magnetic fields than others, depends on the electrical currents of your brain, but this is produced naturally. So in space-time, passive measurements is, uh, is you have light sources that come from the past, maybe billions of years ago, and you want to determine the structure of space-time when we see those lights. And nowadays, since 2015, we have detected also gravitational waves that can, can allow to go even further in the past, perhaps even before the Big Bang. One of the difficulties on, on doing this is the gravitational lensing because uh, when we make observations of, of light, it comes deflected sometimes, or most of the time, because uh, according to the general theory of relativity, if you have a large mass warps space-time, and you see uh, an image 
of a star, for instance, when it's in a position that is not there because light has been deflected. And this, an example of this is a Einstein's cross. You see four different images of the same star. And another example is what's called the double Einstein ring predicted by Einstein. This happens when the observer, uh, the, the, the object that you want to image and the big star or galaxy are aligned in some approximately aligned. So light doesn't know where to go. It goes all over around the circle. And then you see this double ring. This is very similar, tantalizing similar to what happens in optics when you shoot a ray of light in the direction of the optic axis of a biaxial crystal. These are special crystals. Aragonite is an example. Splits, very similar to what's happening here, splits into a cone. And you see this double ring here. And this is observed. And this is also happening on servos, as I said, was predicted by Einstein himself. And, and since 2015, we have gravitational waves. This is the NSF announcement where two black holes collide and produces a big ripple in a space time that was finally detected after many years looking. So I want to uh, give a more precise definition of the observations that we make. This is for passive measurements. So this is uh, on the left, what I'm, is what the region that you want to image. You want to find the structure of space times, say in the past. And this uh, rectangle here is what, what we are observing in a space time. Of course, I can only draw it in two dimensions. So there are several point sources here. This is the case of light. And so point sources emits light, you have the wave fronts of the light. And those come into the observation region. And then you have another point, you have another front, and you observe the intersection of that front with the, with the region of observation. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to take the fronts of the light. Light propagates along cones, as we're going to see these are the fronts. We're going to intersect the fronts with the region of observation, and that's the information that we are going to have. So in other words, can we determine the structure of space-time when we observe wave fronts produced by point sources? So I have to give some definitions uh, of the uh, related to Lorentzian manifolds. Space-time is a Lorentzian manifold. So the metric in this case is semi-definite. For instance, the Minkowski metric is the flat metric, which has minus dx0 squared. This x0 is time, plus dx1 squared, plus dx2 squared, plus dx3 squared. It's different than the case of Riemannian geometry, where all the signs are plus here in flat space time, in flat space. But this is a def semi definite metric. And the sign is minus plus 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 in this particular case. So the definition is a vector is, is light like if the metric vanishes there. So this is the light cone. And remember, signals of light propagate along the light cone. So it's, it's time like if G is negative. This is a region inside the, uh, the solid cone. And it's kosher if the, you consider both. So this is in the in, inside the solid cone and the boundary, which is the light cone. And we have the future and the past. And we are traveling here in our world line, which is uh, 
one line of an object is a time-like, is a geodesic. So a curve is time-like is a tangent vector is time-like. This is a standard definition in Lorentzian geometry. And I had to make another definition, the causal relations. So this is a light cone starting at the point Q. So these are points in the tangent space where the, the, the metric vanishes. Plus is the future light cone and minus is the, is the past. And this is the nodes, the co causal future. That means including the inside here, including or the cone, including the boundary. And uh, I plus indicates the the interior of this uh, light cone. And there is a definition that uh, led to show that the, you can solve the Einstein's field equations and so many things that uh, you assume that uh, the manifold is called globally hyperbolic. So there are no closer, close causal curves. So you cannot travel here and come back. You cannot go to the past and come back to the future. This is believed to be true, but some people uh, in some models of cosmology don't believe that. And mathematically it's said J minus P1. So this is the past cone of P1. So this is the picture here. So this, this is P1 and P2. The past cone intersected with the future cone. Intersection here is compact for every point, for every two points. So this is a in the case of globally hyperbolic, you have the representation of the manifold globally as R cross some Riemannian manifold that depends on time. For every time, there is a Riemannian manifold here. Okay, any questions? Please stop me if you have any questions at any time. Okay, okay now we are ready to define the, the what the measurements that we am proposing, this is the wavefronts of light. So again, you take mu to be a time-like geodesic. This is a world line of an object, ourselves traveling in, the, in time. You take a neighborhood of it, and that's where the observations are going to be made, in a neighborhood of a world line of an object. For instance, astronomical measurements, and so on. You take a set here that is in the path of the point, is in the, in, in the interior of the cone starting at the point P plus, and this is assumed to be relatively compact. So this is a set that you want to image, W, and light will be coming from, sources of light will be coming from W. Okay, so this produces a light cone, the signals, light propagates along the light cone, and then you have a, a cone of directions. This is the light cone. So you intersect the light cone with the, with the set of observation. So this is the light observation set. This gamma, you see the nodes of geodesics starts at the point Q. Geodesics means the curves along the light cone here with the signals of light propagate. You intersect that with the set and that's called the light observation set. That's, that's the name indicates you're observing light in this V coming from W, from points in W. But uh, again, this is, I drew here the, the, the cone of light in a straight way, but as there is gravitational lensing, as I pointed out earlier, and the light cones are not necessarily straight. They might have many complications, in particular, can come back. And then you define what's called the earliest light observation set. So the first time that you observe the light, the sources of light. 
you, you serve this set for the first time. So if it comes back, you don't, you don't take that into account. In the physics literature, this was defined a little bit later than this was defined in 2014. And Engelgard and Horowitz, call, they call it light observation, they call it uh, light concats, because that's what it also it is. You take the light cone and then you cut it with this set. And the paper published in 2018, written in 2014 in math, unfortunately, it takes a long time to get the paper published. You have a smooth, globally hyperbolic Lorentzian manifold of dimension bigger or equal than three. Four dimensions is the one, the physical one. And you take two points, and you take a time-like geodesic joining the two points. And you take a neighborhood of this time-like geodesic, that means a world line. And W is a relatively compact set, what you want to determine. Assume that we know the light observation set. Then we can recover everything about W, the topological structure, the differential structure, and the conformal structure. Let me point this up to change of variables. Of course, everything in, in, in variant and the changes of coordinates, like all the physics should be invariant the changes of coordinates. But let me uh, explain the conformal part here. We're only taking the light cone. The light cone is where G vanishes. So if you take a multiple of the metric, that's, that means a conformal multiple of G, the light cone doesn't change. So you can, at best, from the light observation set, recover the conformal structure of W. So the metric up to a multiple, you have to change of variables. So this is the part about my, uh, my pa mass passive measurements. Now I go more to the PDEs, but they are related questions as we're going to see. Uh, there is one thing is you want to recover the conformal factor. If you know the metric in part of V a priori, suppose you know that it is, it is Euclidean, uh, sorry, the Minkowski metric, for instance, in, we are in vacuum, then we can recover the conformal factor near the points that hit that region. So we can recover the whole metric. Okay, so now I go to active measurements. And for the case of uh, metrics, the Manian metrics, uh, I will describe this result uh, in more, more precisely, Belichev and Kurilev using a unique continuation theory of Tataro that was proven later, they, they show that you can recover the Manian metric, but this is time independent. And this theorem of Tataro is needed for this method to work, it's called the boundary control method. Is the is it why the speed is time dependent does not work, or you need to assume that the way the speed depends analytically on time, which is a very strong assumption. So this is the case of active measurements in oil exploration. Another way to do oil exploration is to have a track that sends explosions again, and you measure the reflection in geophones located at the surface of the Earth. So active measurements uh, in that case, so why they not the, the positions uh, in, in space? You have position and time. You have a solution of the wave equation for the Laplace Beltrami operator associated to a Riemannian metric. So this is a Riemannian metric and mu is a unit outer normal. So this is, you take have a cylinder, and then you measure, you put sources, this is why it's active, on the boundary of the cylinder, and initially you assume that the, there is no contribution. So the speed and the velocity are zero. And what you measure is what's called the Dirichlet-Neumann map, the normal derivative 
respect to the metric of the solution of this equation. And this is the boundary data. So you're given the boundary of the manifold and the difficult to name map. So information on the boundary is repeated here. And the, the, the problem, the inverse problem, can you recover the metric from the difficult to Neumann map? And the result is that it is indeed the case if the metric is independent of time because it uses this unique continuation theorem, very sharp unique continuation theorem of Tataro, and that's only value for metrics depends analytically on time. It's there are counter examples in general. And Eskin has shown that for real analytic metrics in the time variable, then it still holds. But that's again a, a strong assumption and we would like to have just say, for instance, smooth dependence on time. In space time, you cannot guarantee this assumption of real analyticity. So this is what I want to do. And the other method that there is besides the boundary control method that use, was used by Belichev and Kurilev is uh, geometrical optics. Let me explain this in for a simpler case, so suppose you take the standard wave equation, is standard Laplacian plus the potential does not depend on time, say it's sufficiently smooth, doesn't matter with the support in some ball, and H is the heavy side function. You take a plane wave coming from the past with direction omega. So this is the heavy side function of T minus Y omega is one for t bigger or equal than y dot omega is zero otherwise. Then you can find uh, the singularities of the solution. You cannot solve it explicitly. There are existence and uniqueness result, but you want to solve this as explicitly as possible. This is the heavy side function plus an amplitude times a smoother wave, t minus y omega plus, this is t minus y omega if this is positive and is zero if it's negative. So like S plus to the class. So it's a progressive wave because it's zero if T less or equal than Y dot, dot omega times an amplitude. And then something smoother, the derivative of this is the heavy side function, the derivative of the square is this one up to a constant and so on. So you can recover the singularities, you can see how the singularities are moving. And this is what we are going to try to do for nonlinear equations, like Einstein's field equations. And one point of linear equations like this is as the how you have different directions of the waves, different omega. Omega is the direction of the wave, it's a unit vector. You can have uh, different directions, but the plane waves don't interact because the superposition principle is a sum of, uh, you have a solution of the equation, the sum is also a solution. So then nothing happens. There's, there's no interaction of singularities. And for nonlinear waves, we're going to see that the nonlinearity helps. This is uh, the topic for active measurements, very, in a, in a very crude diagram, you have waves coming here and we're going to take four waves and this describes the normal to the waves. And then they're going to intersect at a point and they're going to generate a new wave that will be measured in the region that where we are observing. So if there was, if there was a linear equation, these waves will continue, nothing happens, but because of the nonlinear interaction, a new wave comes up and that's what you observe and that will give information about the metric in a certain region. And let me give an example, a simpler example. This is a toy model we're going to consider more physical examples uh, soon. 
take the wave equation associated to the metric plus a nonlinear term, a quadratic nonlinear term. And we're going to put sources here. And the support of the solution is contained in the solid cone starting in the support. This is in order to guarantee that there is a unique solution. This is causality. And the support is contained in the region where we are observing. And I wrote here the, the wave equation. This is associated to Lorentzian metric. So it's a, it has the signs a little bit different because you have a minus plus plus plus, so it's negative determinant and so on. So it's a, similar to the Riemannian Laplace Bertrami, but this is a wave type equation. This is the determinant and G upper IJ is the inverse of the metric, like it's a standard differential geometry. And then F is a controllable source. And here we have to assume that the sources are small because we, we cannot guarantee there is a unique solution of the nonlinear equation uh, in, uh, in an interval of time unless you have a small source here. So we only are allowed to take the small sources. And what we're going to measure is the source to solution map. So we're taking the source f on the right hand side of the equation and we're going to measure the solution in the region of observation and the question is can you recover the metric from from that information again a is going to be non-zero always so we always have a non-linearity in the equation because if A is equal to zero, we don't know how to solve this problem because the, the, the metric will be dependent on time and we cannot apply the belichick kurilev result. Uh, we show that uh, this is indeed the case. We assume that again, it's globally hyperbolic in, in, in space time, one time three, dimen uh, three space dimensions. This is a time like path, a world line of an object containing the points P plus and P minus. You take a neighborhood again, and you, as you assume that you know this set and you know the metric here where you're observing, and you know the, uh, the measurement operator. So this is again source the source on the right hand side to the solution just on this set B. You're measuring this here. And then you can determine the metric up to, again, a conformal factor up to a multiple in this diamond type set, which is the causal set. That means the waves at the start in a, in this time like geodesic where we are traveling, this uh, world line of an object, come back. Because if the waves don't come back, there is no way that you can do it. So this is the maximal causal set. And remember, this is assumed to be compact here. So this depends, this, this set depends on how much time are you serving and the behavior of the geodesics. Okay, hey, let me see whether I have time to, yeah, I have time to describe this. So, so this is, a, and if you want to recover the A, you can, if you know the metric G, you can recover the A here, the nonlinearity. I didn't write that down, but that's, uh, because you can generalize this to, to uh, semilinear equations. So we, we take a function that depends on X and Z, is real value. And, and this is a small neighborhood here. This represents the solutions. Then we say that H is non, non, yet genuinely nonlinear if the linear part is zero, and then some derivative of this is non-zero. So, Maybe it's not quadratic, 
like this case. Maybe it's higher order, but um, maybe you have an expansion starting with quadratic, cubic, and so on. So you can consider this is, uh, we call it gen generally nonlinear. Um, you can have infinite order if it's, um, there is no such in derivative. So in this case, you have a globally hyperbolic, again, one plus three dimensional Lorentz manifold, a tab like geodesic. Uh, you take now H instead of the quadratic term. And this is generally nonlinear. Then if you take the source to solution map and F is measured in a small neighborhood of zero, then we can recover the conformal class of the metric. We cannot recover the metric in this diamond type set that I drew before. This is the maximal set where we can because of causality and the, the coefficients of the nonlinearity up to again conform a factor and diffeomorphism. Again, there is always a diffeomorphism invariance in the problem. The metric also is up to diffeomorphism. Okay, so this is very general and uh, semilinear equation. And if you want to recover the nonlinear term, this is what I was saying earlier about the A. Suppose you know the metric, you want to recover the nonlinearity here, and with the same information, H is generally nonlinear. Then you can recover all the coefficients of the nonlinearity, the, the coefficients of order two, three, four, and so on. You expand this. Uh, if you, then you have to assume that you know the metric. So you can recover H, I mean, essentially all the derivatives of H at zero, I mean, all the coefficients of the nonlinearity, the quadratic term, the cubic term, and so on, in this time on, not, not the conformal class, because you have fixed the metric here. Okay, so let me give very briefly an idea of the proof. And I already mentioned, so we're going to, uh, part of it, we're going to construct sources here in this region V, where, near where we are, we are traveling, so that they interact at a point and then produces an artificial point source. And that point source, artificial point source, artificial wave comes back and we can measure the light, the earliest light observation set because we measure the intersection of this with the neighborhood where we are. And like we can apply the previous result about passive measurements. We know this light observation set, the earliest light observation set. So, and the way to do the interactions is uh, like in geometrical optics, we send singularities, and they intersect at a point, and this point generates new singularities that we can measure. And that gives the information about the inverse problem. So let me do this for the, for the quadratic, the case of quadratic case. So we, we know how to do this interaction from previous work in, this is just a microlocal analysis, I'm not going to explain it, how to do this analysis of the interaction of the waves. And let me give you an example in Minkowski space, where it's flat space. These are the plane waves like we had before xj is equal to zero, xj is t minus x dot omega j. So some plane waves coming in. You have some constant times t minus x omega plus, like we had before. You put large m so that these are smooth enough. 
this is t minus x omega plus to some power, large power, so that this is smooth. This is what, this is the heavy side function. We had them before. So these are plane waves moving in. And these are called conormal distribution. And this is just a name. These are just plane waves and the singularity propagate along the waves. So we say that propagates along the normal. And, and you have the, the, the two, the two in, interaction of two waves, interaction of three waves is a line in four dimensional space. And generically four waves will interact in one point. And we do what's, uh, what's called the second order linearization, the interaction of two waves. So we put two sources with parameters epsilon one and epsilon two, which are small in order to have a solution of the equation. And we look at the second order linearization, which is given here. And this is Q, where Q is the inverse of the wave equation. So this is just solving the, the wave equation. We're doing it for this. So in geometrical optics, oh, I, I forgot this, uh, to explain this page. You have a u squared. The first term is the linearization. You just take the inverse of this. The second term, you take the interaction times a. And a is non zero. And q is the inverse of the wave operator. And we know exactly how this propagates singularities. If a is non zero, you will get new singularities. And this is a triple interaction and the fourth order interaction. And this is, a, we are not going to neglect this term because we're going to take four waves. So here we are it, it, taking two waves. This is the, the second order linearization. The linearization of the problem does not help, as I mentioned before, because we don't know how to solve the problem, the inverse problem. So this is Q, A, U1, U2. Again, A is non zero. This is the inverse of the wave operator. And, and this, the important thing uh, that the, well, this is technically, this contains only like, like directions. These are, nothing happens in this case. The singular support of this new, the, the second order linearization is the same as is the waves will not interact. So new, no new interesting singularities are produced by the interaction of two waves. But in three ways, uh, we, now we, had, we take the third order linearization, the interaction of three waves does produce new waves. So this is the computation, the double interaction, and then now triple, it has several terms. And this interaction happens in the Minkowski case, in the case of uh, an interaction of these plane waves. And in this case, this, the, the conormal to this, I mean, the normal direction to the plane contain light-like directions. Remember, signals propagate along light, the light cone, as in new singularities are produced. It's very similar to what happens in a shock wave. In shock wave, you have a line here, subsonic and sonic. And then because of the change in the speed here, a shock wave is produced. Shock wave. This is similar. It's not exactly the same, but it's similar to what happens. So new singularity is produced in that case. So this is the case of three waves interaction. And the analysis of singularities has been done in the two plus one dimensional case by Boni, Merzos, Ritter, and there are examples of Rauch and Reed. So a new wave, a conic wave is produced in that case. And now the fourth order interaction is to take a fourth order linearization. So this is what we want to look at. And in that case, the Force interaction is generically a point. And in this case, 
you have all the possible directions starting at the point Q. So the singularities, new singularities are produced is the, the plane waves that you had before, the new ones produced by the triple interaction, but the important one that we're going to use is the fourth order interaction. You get the light, the forward light cone started at the point Q. This is the artificial point source. So we have created an artificial point source that produces a light cone and that creates a new wave that we can observe. So this is the picture that I showed at the beginning. You have interaction of three waves and drawing it in the Minkowski case, and there is a new wave coming out produced by the interaction at the point. And then you can measure it in this neighborhood. These uh, darker rings here are the triple order interaction. This is the one we use because that comes back to the region of observation and we can measure it. We can measure the light observation set, the earliest light observation set, and recover the metric according to the theorem I mentioned before on passive measurements. And that's the idea of the proof. It's, uh, of course, you have to realize this, uh, that's more technical, but that's a simple idea. And this is, uh, they, they are very small plane waves right? because the sources are very small. The same picture produces a new wave. Okay, you have five minutes. So this has been described, have been used the same method. I mean, this is, uh, explained for a very simple example for the purpose of the talk. And also it's interesting to look at an example that is easier to compute. Einstein's equation, we couple with scalar fields. We started this in 2003, and then we have a much better version in 2018. Einstein's equation coupled with electromagnetic equations in vacuum with uh, Lassas and Iran Wang. And uh, unifying these two we, with uh, one, we, we consider Einstein's equation themselves, coupled with vacuum or, or matter uh, for a very general uh, coupling of Einstein's equation. For nonlinear elasticity, which is another important example of a nonlinear equation. And um, Jan Mills has been considered by these authors. And we can also do an inverse scattering. And instead of uh, looking at semilinear equations uh, about the source to solution map, we look at the Dirichlet Neumann map with uh, Peter Hinz and Jan Charlie. So let me, look, in the five minutes I have left, have five minutes? Yeah, four minutes. Let me explain Einstein's equation. Of course, it's much more complicated equations. It's a system on the metric tensor, nonlinear. And there are 10 equations here. It's very complicated. T denotes the stress momentum energy tensor. And this is the geometric part, the Einstein tensors. It consists of the Ricci curvature minus the, these are all the summation, here is summation on these indices times the metric. This is the scalar curvature. So this, uh, what is usually said is the, the, the curvature of space time tells matter how to move and matter tells space time how to curve. These are the famous Einstein's field equations. In vacuum, of course, t is equal to zero. So in a special, this is a system that is independent of coordinates, but you, go, you calculate in wave map coordinates. That means these are, the coordinates are solutions of the wave equation. The Einstein's equation can be written as a quasi-linear hyperbolic system. So this is the, like a wave equation here. 
plus a nonlinear term, and this has a quadratic nonlinear has nonlinear quadratic type of nonlinearities in the gradient as well. And this is a conservation law that says the total energy is conserved. This comes from Bianchi's identity. This is very roughly speaking. Uh, and what we're going to add a source. In order to do that, we're going to couple it with matter. This is the Klein Klein Gordon equation. This is the mass here. Also with the source here, there are small source. This is the stress energy center with, that will depend on phi. And I, I wrote it down here, but then it doesn't matter. The, and you have to choose sources so that the conservation law is satisfied. I'm going a little fast here, but I just, uh, the same ideas that we had before work for this much more complicated system as you just have to do to do the nonlinear geometrical optics. And in this case, you can recover the metric, not just the conformal factor of the metric because the, the, the lower order term here is involves the metric. So from this term, you can recover the conformal factor, but this helps to recover the metric itself. So the theorem, and I will finish with this, you have the neighborhood here. You have the, you know the metric in this neighborhood. You know the scalar field here, phi, in this neighborhood. And you have the forces, the sources in this neighborhood. And you have that the satisfied Einstein's equation coupled with matter. And you have the divergence is equal to zero. This is necessary for conservation of energy. This data set, this information determines uniquely the metric in this diamond type region. This is the, as I said before, this is the maximal causal region starting in the time like geodesic or the world line of the object where we're observing. So of course, uh, we would like to, uh, to do more numerical simulations. So I welcome anyone, I don't know enough numerics to do this, but it would be nice to, not only for Einstein's equation, for the other equations to do some numerics on this. We did something for elastic waves, but I don't have time to explain this, which is another important system nonlinear system. You can apply this method to any nonlinear hyperbolic equation. Is you, you look at the propagation of singularities, how the singularities interact, the waves interact, and the show that produces a new wave. Of course, for every system is different. You have to do it. There's no unifying ways. The ideas are the same, but the, the, te the te technical part is different for every equation. For instance, it would be nice to do it for Navier stocks, uh, with Navier stock system in fluid dynamics. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gunther. I went two minutes over. No, that's okay. Uh, so before I open the, uh, the question and answer session, so there was one uh, uh, anonymous attendee who uh, asked a question on the chat box. So it says in curved space time, how does the causal diamond look like? Uh, specific, especially if we don't have time like killing vector field for such space time. Well, uh, this again, this uh, we don't know a, a priori because the behavior of the geodesics can be quite complicated. But what we were saying in the, in the causal domain whatever it is, it can be very large or very small. So this, it will be nice to have a, a better description of this uh, domain. This doesn't look like this in the case of uh, when the space is curved, right? The, the geodesics are curved and so on. But this, there are no caustics you can draw a picture like this, but there are conjugate points and this can be quite complicated, but 
the point here is that you can determine uh, the metric in a much larger region than the one where you're observing. And of course, once you have determined the metric here, if you can, you can make new observations where you know the metric and start uh, going further and further in space time. But of course, you have to be able to do that. You have to have you serve here near the Earth, say, you have to have a space station where you can, where you have determined already the metric and then you go further and further and so on. There are several questions that one would like to do here for simulations in particular. So thanks, Gunter. There is one more question from uh, Jean-Claude Cunin. And uh, so he's asking, could you say again why interactions of more than four waves are negligible? Oh, because it's just a small. If you are in higher, in, in bigger dimension, then you could consider it. I only expanded up to order four. And then, because that's the one that is going to give me the information. So I neglected this because I don't know how, what they are. I mean, I can keep going here and uh, see whether that will give new information. But uh, I, I, this information we already have it in the fourth order interaction. You are in higher dimensions to get a point source, you may need to go further because uh, uh, you know, you need to have inter intersection to be a point. For some equations, and this has been done for some cases, for some specific equations, you can go, you just need to go to order three. But for Einstein's equation, which are very complicated, we show that you can, we don't know how to use the triple interaction but the fourth order interaction. For instance, in nonlinear elasticity, it was enough to do two, two interactions to get the information. So it depends on the equation. But it's negligible because it's a order epsilon to the fifth compared to the other terms. They're already small, but it's much smaller. Thanks, Gunter. Um, Saiket Mazumdar, uh, he has a question. So in some of your results, why only the conformal class of the metric is recovered if the problem conformally invariant in those cases? What? Sorry? So the question is, in some of your results, why only the conformal class of the okay. metric is recovered if the problem conformally invariant in those cases? No, uh, it's because... Uh, in the case of Einstein's equation, we can recover the metric completely. In the case, in this case, uh, it's not conformally invariant, but that's what we can do because we can determine the light observation set. If A will be one, say, and you know A, then you can recover the metric completely. It's, a, it's, the, it's because we're recovering the light observation set and that's conformal invariant. So maybe there is another way to recover the metric completely, but we don't know it at this time. But again, I repeat, if you know something about A, like one, then a multiple will violate that. And so you will be able to recover the conformal factor. But for Einstein's equation, which is important physical example, there is no conformal invariance. We recover the metric completely. For Einstein's equation, this, uh, this is a result with Wang. And for the elasticity, we can recover the parameters completely. So um, are there any, any more questions? Please feel free to ask uh, Professor Ullman. Gunther. Gunther. <laughs> so any more questions from the participants? So, 
so gunther i have a question so in the coefficients uh, that uh, are they dependent uh, time dependent or no or is it yes. space dependent yes they, they no, could be time, time dependent as well yeah they are time dependent that's the whole point all of this all of this is uh, these are time dependent the metric is time dependent the a is time dependent this is time dependent the h the x x, x here is, x is x and t. time and y i call it t and y uh, uh, okay 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 the, the 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 point here is that for the linearized problem if you linearize this equation you cannot solve the inverse problem we don't know how to solve the inverse problem but the non -lin the non linear case we can the non linearity helps that's the point I see. Yeah, everything and, uh, depends on time. And what about some? Uh, are there? Is there any interest for some fractional in this direction? Yes, of course. You can. Yeah, there has there's some uh, fractional wave equations plus nonlinear time. Yeah, there are some examples of this. I see. And there is, and of course. Uh, uh, they have seen, uh, uh, I don't know of a particular paper at, at this point, but I know for the elliptic problem there has been fractional plus nonlinear terms. Uh, right. mm -hmm. but, but in the, the context of wave equation, it has been studied as well, right? Huh? The context of wave equation. Yeah. The fractional, the fractional wave Right. The fractional wave equation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I see. Um, are there any more questions? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, well, time for dinner for you <laughs> and breakfast for me. Right. So, um, if there are no more questions, uh, so let's thank uh, Gunther again uh, for this very nice talk. And uh, thank you, Gunther, for uh, taking the time. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, hope to see you in physical, uh, you know, uh, physical presence in India sometime soon. Yeah, you, you have canceled the, the meeting in December, have you? For January. Yeah, so we have, uh, so we are, we have, uh, we haven't made the announcement yet, but we have postponed it to next September. September. Okay, AAP will be also moved to to the summer of 2022. I see. Uh -huh. Yeah, because you know it's impossible to do it next year. Right. Right. Okay. So, so thank is, you. Is your, is, is your student there? Can I see his face? You have oh. a student or two students? I have. Uh, okay, one person is in the. Uh, 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 I think he's joining via YouTube, but uh, um, Salman Senapati. Um, Salman, can you hear me? He left. No, no, he's he here. I can see. Yeah, he's here. I will allow him to talk. Can you show your face? Yeah, okay. S Salman, can you? So he cannot. I have to do something. I have to uh, include him as a. Just give me a time. A few minutes. Yeah. So, uh, so Gunther, I have currently two students. Uh, uh, one is Suman Kumar Sahu. Ah, so Suman is here. So this is Suman Senapati. Hello. Now, can I see your face? <laughs> yeah. So he's actually turned his video on. I don't see. Yeah, I have to go down. I guess. Oh, here, there. I see Suman Senapati. Okay. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. So uh, he's working on uh, hyperbolic inverse problems. Oh, really? No. Um, and uh, so with uh, with Rakesh, uh, uh, we have a formally determined. Uh, uh, you know, we, we studied a formally determined hyperbolic inverse problem. I think he's going to work on this at the. Uh, uh, works, you know the 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 conference, the uh, Zoom conference by by Katya Kupchik. 
I think this is a topic that he is going, he is planning to talk on, but I'm not sure. Oh, okay, okay. With Rakesh, and uh, uh, he has also worked on some stability estimates for uh, uh, this hyperbolic inverms with time-dependent coefficients. Right. Uh, okay. No nonlinear yet. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, we also plan to study uh, something related to. Um, fractional heat um, but let's see we have just you know i have i have a student who do, who did the heat equation for the magnetic schrodinger yeah i know plus plus lower order term yeah. um lily right lily yeah 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 we have been looking at that paper as well very okay. interesting mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. But who, and, where is your other student? I think the other student joined via YouTube. I'm not able oh, to okay. see him here. Okay. Okay. Uh, so he is graduating this year, and uh, he's, uh, uh, you know, he was supposed to join uh, Ivascula uh, for, oh, for okay. his postdoctoral position, but then COVID intervened. So I think uh, he may join maybe January or February, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. You cannot travel. Huh? Yeah, so right now, um, well, the thing is that they are not giving visas or anything. So I think now they have opened up the consulate in uh, New Delhi. So he has to go there for his uh, resident permit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, you know, my former student, your postdoc, Sombudo, is here. Um, but he doesn't yeah, no, no, I talked to him. I just talked to him last week. Right. Yeah, he told me you are you are doing something together with one of your students, not you, not you, the other one. Right? Yeah, Suman Kumar Sahu. Right. Yeah. So uh, we are in the process of writing it up. We'll send it to you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Gunther, once again uh, for taking the time. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. Was it understandable? Well, you have heard this talk before, right? I've heard some parts of it, yeah. Was it understandable? So yeah. you tell me, Sumain, Sumain. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, yeah. So I understand some part of it, yeah. So. yeah okay. 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 Yeah, thanks, Gunther. Um, okay, thank and, you for inviting uh, me. Thanks. And before we end the meeting, uh, Prasenjit has an announcement regarding the next talk. So over to you, Prasenjit. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Ullman, for this wonderful talk. Uh, thank you. For, for the participants, I, I hope you enjoyed Professor Ullman's talk thoroughly. And uh, we'll see you in two days, next Thursday, for Professor Eduardo Ferizel's talk on fluid dynamics equation. And since then, uh, bye. And I request you all of you to leave the platform now. Thanking you all. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Gunther. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Rosalind. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.